Hello, and welcome to the 148th episode of From Alpha to Omega. Today is Friday, the 29th of January, 2021, and I'm your host, Tom O'Brien. Today we welcome back Greg Belvedere to the show to discuss Corey Robbins' book, The Reactionary Mind. Things went a little bit awry as we read two very different editions of the book, but such is life. Part 2 of this episode will be released as a patron-only episode in a couple of days. This week, I have the new patrons, Dusted and Social, Commandante Ice Wallocum, and Bob Sacamano to thank. If you'd like to help keep the lights on and the episodes flowing, head on over to Patreon, where for only five commie dollars a month, you get access to a heap of bonus episodes and live streams. This Saturday, we begin our new reading group series, Understanding Class by Eric Olin Wright. So make sure to grab yourself a book and join us in the YouTube chat. Okay, let's join the interview. Greg, thanks for coming back on the show. Yeah, good to be here. Good to be here. So we both uh, read two different books in preparation for this interview. They both have the same title. You read the first edition of The Reactionary Mind, and I read the second edition, and there seems to be very little similarity <laughs> between the two books. So There's a lot of overlap, but it's I I was not expecting to run into this big a problem with uh, different editions. I don't think either of us anticipated this. No. So we'll have to see how we get on. We were talking previously, you came on the show before, and we talked about the trend towards eco-fascism we can see with characters like what we talked in, in 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 depth about was John Michael Greer. Interestingly, since since that, only about a week or two ago, I went back to look at uh, Dmitry Orlov's site for the first time in in like years and years and years. I don't know when the last time I looked on it, like four or five years ago. And man, he has gone exactly the same trajectory. The COVID is a hoax. Just out outright nationalist talking about how Antifa are the terrorists. They're actually the fascists. Antifa are the fascists. We have to fight Antifa. Just completely, like, I don't know how much these guys are following the money. I get the impression there are reactionaries, but I do reckon there is some follow the money happening with these guys. But uh, So in the light of all that, in the context, you said that you read this book by Corey Robin called The Reactionary Mind. I ordered the book anyway to give it a read, and I think it's an excellent book, particularly the second edition. No, I'm joking. Uh, the, the second edition is much better than the first edition. Let first me just edition. <laughs> it's an excellent book. I would really recommend people to read it. What was it about the book that grabbed you so much when you read it? I think for me, you know, I try not to... I obviously um, have a, a certain idea of the way that conservatives think. And I wonder sometimes how much it's shaded by my own views. If it's, you know, a fair view on them, you know, to just demonize or, you know, think about the, the other side as, you know, intransigent or stupid or whatever. And I think what was interesting about this book is that he really tried to like, understand where the conservative mind is coming from, what generates all those types of things. But what was really interesting to me was how it looked at how it's obviously in the title and it's in, in just embedded in the language, but how much conservatism is a reaction to liberal or left ideas and how much that shapes them and how in, in a certain way that it shapes them and creates these types of like changes the way they think changes the way they think from what is a very conservative way of looking th- at things framed in very th- conservative ways to adopting the language and the reasoning of the left or liberals and depending on who they're reacting to and how that's like where they draw their power and i think it, the reason for me it really resonated Um, with someone like Greer or even with like the alt-right is they do a very good job of taking like, you know, you, you hear the right, the alt-right say it all the time. It's like, Oh, now, now it's cool to be right wing, you know, where, you know, and so they kind of 
adopted some of the affects or you know some of the the same not the same values but arguing towards the same things but but doing it from the right and that's interesting to me because it it it's kind of how people get roped into these things it's kind of how people last week on twitter somebody said had posted something this person will remain nameless they know who they are but they they, they posted something about how oh i don't understand why people don't like camille palia you know they're, they're like she says all these things that are that are right on when she criticizes academia and this and that and the other thing and it's like yeah sure fair enough she does but where she go with it after that and i think so much of the way reactionaries operate when they're effective is doing that it's taking a left-wing idea or a left-wing value or even just a left-wing affectation and bringing it back to the same old reactionary you know viewpoint or values doing it in a way that's very subtle and very very smart like very it's 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 kind of amazing actually the way they do it and they're very motivated at it and sometimes actually when they don't have something to react to they kind of don't know what to do and that's why you see these things pop up when there is either some sort of emergent leftist economic um, movement or proto movement or when there's some sort of cultural thing that is you know goes against you know more conservative social values yeah and, that, and that's why i found it was interesting and so gr someone like greer he does that very well he kind of does that with the environmental uh, language and liberal language and to some degree like leftist language he kind of takes that and, and and says like yes i know you think all of these things is it but do these people really do this and maybe we should go back to this way of looking at that and in many ways he's persuasive to a point but yeah and that's why i found it interesting because it was i was able to say like oh this is something they've been people have been doing since hobbes you know this is this is just this isn't anything new this is like you know it's like one of those things where once you identify what people are doing it and you give it a name you can just you know it's like magic you can ah oh, shit i got you i banish you <laughs> shit, you know yeah it's like white genocide you know it's using the terms of the left to make yourself feel like you're left or progressive but actually towards reaction unions like even from a an evolutionary biological point of view we see this just even like in how you will have certain like types of flies or whatever that will mimic looking like a, a, a bee or a wasp so that other animals will be afraid they will get stung. You know, we see this, this tactic in the natural world all the time. You know, from a game theoretical point of view, it was inevitable that the right would essentially learn from the strength of the left and to mimic it in such a way as to attract people towards their ends it, it's one of those uh, you know he talks about nietzsche in the book but the thing you know the uh, i probably one of nietzsche's most famous quotes is you know battle not with monsters lest you become a monster yourself when you gaze into the abyss the abyss gazes back and you see that like if you're going to try and fight the other side they're gonna they're gonna react too and you're gonna have these types of back and forth interestingly enough in regards to greer and greer following the money he's gotten wise and it was very funny to because i he had a post recently where he took more of a you could tell he was shifting his tone back to what it was before trump and he's he's kind of trying to play a little closer to the middle now it was it was interesting so yeah he they follow the money and even if they don't follow the money it's like everyone else in uh the media world they whether it's conscious or not, they see where the the clicks are and they they just follow it, whether they're thinking I need the money or whether they're just, you know, rats going for the dopamine kick like like all of us. We're all rats. Let's be honest here. I certainly am. One thing that in the book he talks quite a lot about is like how conservatives are very worried about their private power. So for example, like how a, a man or a husband in the before the women's liberation movement was worried about losing control over their wife, how the slave owner was worried about control over their slave. You know, I think today 
how parents a lot of time are worried about control over their children. That this is, seems to be like a, a key tenet in how conservatism works is that it exploits this fear of changes to the private power relations, not just systemic power relations, but to the into the they play on the personal interactions of people in their day to day lives. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely, and I think that's one of the most powerful things about the book. He kind of makes that comparison between what does he say, uh, the factory, the farm, and the household, or the fa factory, the farm, and the family, or something like that. Yeah, and because yeah, for the average person who doesn't have a lot of economic or political power, but if you're a man and you're the head of the household, then maybe you do have some sort of say of what goes on there. And the idea that you would lose just the little bit of power that you have there, even though that you know you might actually be better off in terms of like shifting some of these things. This is something that I actually want to write about at some point. Probably once I get out of my pandemic funk, I'll probably do something along that lines. I had a video about this called a uh, fear of a cuck planet, because I, I do think there is a lot of, you know, reactionary sexual hysteria going on in the fantasies and fears that a lot of people have about these things. But in, in terms of the family, like, I don't know, this will be interesting to talk about with you because I, I know you have kids uh, or, or a child around um, one, one. Okay. Uh, so, but like you see this, especially if you're in the UK, this hysteria about trans kids, you know, this hysteria about like, yeah, they're going to put your kids on puberty blockers and you're, they're all going to be trans kids and they're going to be sterilized and like all these things. And it's just like, and to be honest, when I first heard this, I was like, well, that's not good. These ch these kids getting sterilized. Like I don't, but the longer I sat with it, the longer I realized, well, like, okay, well, why do I care about this? Like, you know, let's say my kid, one of my kids was trans. All right. Why do I care? Like, like if they're going to be happier being, you know, being in the body that, you know, matches with, I don't even know the correct terminology, but you get my point. If they're going to be happier that way, why do I care if they can't have kids? Maybe that they, they don't want. I want that because I'm a father and most parents want to have kids and grandkids and be the grandfather and have all that because that's that's nice. But the idea that that should supersede someone's own individual desire to be at home in their own body i don't I, I don't agree with that and like uh the other thing and this is just a tangent on this like you know facebook shows you you know this like oh this is five years ago yeah that's seven years ago today whatever and it's like i think for a lot of people there's that thing that happens where you see that kid and you go you know my son's seven now and i see a picture of him when he was like one or two and i'm like where did that fucking kid go like that kid's not around. That kid's not there anymore. He's big. He's not this little guy bumping around. He's bigger and he's able to do all sorts of other things. And I think people don't get that the same with, you know, like, like they don't get it. It's like the same. It's the same thing. Like if your kid, you know, is in a situation where they decide they're going to transition, it's like, well, it's the same thing. Like, yeah, that kid isn't that little boy anymore. They're that grown woman or what, whatever it is, you know, and and there's a there's a desire to keep control over that when it's not best for you know the person that's getting control over and i would argue in other aspects of sexual matters probably not the best for the person who's the head of the household either but that's a even when it comes to like philosophies on child rearing like currently we're we're homeschooling but we do uh basically we don't you don't teach them anything essentially i hope social services aren't listening to this and, uh, <laughs> but like we essentially don't do anything and it's all child driven like to the extent that like you know it could be you're doing lego one day with them for a day or it could be then you know seriously sometimes watching like stuff from the royal institute in london he's only seven and we watch something about like black holes that's kind of for a physics audience and i don't know what percentage of it is going into his brain <laughs> Yeah. you know what i mean but like some of it's going in you know and he's obviously enjoying it like and it's like so many people have difficulty with like i think even approaching say how you interact with your children that it must be in a way that's has got like very hierarchical power relations you know i'm your dad do what you're told 
all the time. Now, you know, there's definitely, you know, when you have a kid, you've got some of that. You still still have to do some of that. But like, I think a lot of conservative people would really object to this power relation <laughs> differential that say we might have, say, with a kind of a more a strict upbringing like that. You know, I think it works even at, at this level. You know, the conservatism comes right down into these interactions and probably like has probably a lot to do with like things like people having bad inter family relations, mental health problems with overpowering parents and things like that. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that's been interesting as a parent is to kind of explore what you're talking about, because like, yeah, at the end of the day, like they're I'm obviously an adult, I know more than my child, and I should I have the say over certain things. But at the same time, like, I don't want to reinforce certain hierarchical structures within my family when they are not necessary. And a, a lot of them aren't like, you know, and and it's there are times where I'm like, could you just do that? Could you just do that thing I've asked you to do? But then there are other times when I'm like, when I'm like, okay, here's why I need you to do this. Here's why. And then, you know, and there's lots of back and forth. There's lots of like, yeah, the idea that you wouldn't have such strict control over things. Like, I, I think a lot, I think, I think as a child, I felt very confined by a lot of that my dad wasn't overly strict but he was definitely like firm on a lot of things and i think that to some extent i'm very like happy that that i get my my you know my kids are just wild and yeah they they go to public school but it, but my son like it does a lot of stuff like self-directed you know and that's like big on me like i want them to be their own person and not have everything coming from above and not to expect everything to come from above. And, but like some people, it's just, and a matter of fact, I think the thing I mentioned that really made me sour on John Michael Greer was his thing about corporal punishment and like, just the, just the normalization of, yeah, that's fine. Like, and I don't want to like, certainly don't want to criminalize and probably not even like, you know, demonize too much people who do do corp corporal punishment, but like, what are you reinforcing? You know, like, what are you, I definitely think that like one of the things that's been hard for me as a parent is like, help me think a lot more about power, even with in my own house is like these kinds of questions that come up when you're trying to discipline your kids, because you, you don't want to be like, you don't want to be like harsh and stuff, but you also need to set boundaries and then like even more than that like for me like there's sometimes I, I you know i got two kids sometimes I, I yell and i lose my temper and it's like okay daddy was wrong <laughs> no? daddy was wrong daddy yeah. shouldn't have yelled you know what because 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 you see it in your kids you see it in your kids you see if you're if you do something if you have some sort of like 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 my daughter will have behaviors that are like a little bit whiny or a little bit whatever and and i, I could say oh that's this is a girl she's this or that and the other thing but no some of that shit she learned from me yeah <laughs> you know and so i gotta watch it like uh, you know yeah i too must quit being a whiny bastard that's what you're saying greg <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> yeah no like uh you know and it, it, it gets you like I'm, like kids really make you learn it's in like really simple things like I have great difficulty getting him out of his pajamas and he will say like well, why do i have to get out of my pajamas and i'd say because you you know your pajamas are your night clothes and he'd say well why can't i just wear them during the day if i'm staying in the house and there's not a good answer to these questions you know and like it really would irritate me but like you know on some level you got to give it to them you're going to go you know they're actually using their logic and the fact that you're getting irritated is probably a, a, at least some of the time is because you realize that they've got you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And 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 look, like I, I don't think you should be a complete like like I, I don't like the idea of people who are just like uh, who view their kids as their as their friends. You're not they're not your friends. They're your kids. You know, you still have a different relationship. <laughs> you're that. not my friend. You're you are not my friend. Yeah. yeah. So I constantly you know, tell him that constantly yeah, we have a lot of fun, uh, but, but at the same time, there's definitely like, like, 
one of the ways you learn things in this world is you learn how to deal with authority figures, you know? And I think that's actually an important skill to have and to see like, oh, did you lie about that? Oh, you shouldn't have lied about that. Oh, you came clean with it? Good. That's very good. It's like, oh, you lied about that? Oh, but you lied about it and you did it in such a way that you didn't get caught? Good on you. Good on you. Like, you have to learn those things a little bit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's a good one. Yeah. But we digress. We digress. Sorry. Yeah, I was just thinking about lying. I remember the first time I... I, I can remember the first time I ever lied when I was a kid. And I got I got caught. I ha I bought... I took 10 pence off the mantelpiece. And when I got off the school bus, I went into the shop and I bought like a... Uh, uh, and like an ice lolly for like 10 pence ice pop or whatever you call it in america and i didn't have time to eat it at all before i went into class so what i did is i thought i know what i'll do i'll put it into my pencil case and so i put it i put it into my pencil case to, so that i'd have it like at 11 o'clock when we'd have a break and you know like pencil case is like full of pencil pairings and everything and then it like it came to 11 o'clock when I was like, I opened it, so I said, "Oh, I'll have my ice ice lolly now." And I opened it up, and uh, of course, it had melted. Like, what was I thinking? And like, I was dumbfounded. I was like, "Where's it gone?" And uh, <laughs> yeah, I got home, and my mother was saying, "What happened to that ten pence that was on the mantelpiece?" And she knew I took it, you see, but and she was seeing what I would lie. I was like, uh, "I don't know." And she said, well, "Where did you get the uh, ice lolly that your brother said you had today in school?" And I was like, uh, "You know." This guy Franklin Nugent gave him, gave it to me. You know, a guy who was like five years older than me, just randomly. I just I picked it. Obviously, I just lying in the middle, totally totally caught. When I was four. I, I always remember getting caught that lie. It was such a. I remember being so surprised that the thing had melted. It shows you how how dumb I was. Really, um, that's a really pointless story. Let's. We're really off track here. Let's get. Yeah, one thing in in the book he, he constantly talks about is how like this idea that conservatives have of themselves, which is that they nearly consider themselves like traditionalists on 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 some on, on some level. Like we just want things that we know already. Like when you were making the the case for John Michael Greer was making the case for some of his ideas was like why go and try this new thing? Why don't we go? back towards something we know that works but like the conservative has this idea that you know in actual fact that, that they want things to stay the same we want to go back to the good old days but in reality conservatism is is a highly dynamic force that they don't ever seek to go back to things you know what was it he had um there was a quote i think from was it delanda or somebody Things are going to have to change around here if we're going to get them back to the way they were. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly, exactly. Because you, because you can't go back. Like you can't go. Like, like John Michael Greer has a post-industrial fiction, and it's about America descending into like a post-industrial feudal state. And I think he romanticizes that. I think he would like love that. Actually, who knows that might happen. But like the point is, like you. It wouldn't look like that. It's just not going to look like the way he's imagining. As much as as much as it's not going to look like maybe uh, Star Trek, which he loves to lambast, um, it's it's not going to look like it's not going to look like a post industrial like you know like a feudal North America. You know, like yeah, you you can't go back. Too many things have changed. Too many things like the idea that the same things that have uprooted all those old things. Like they're there now, like all those, you know, new ways of interacting and new technologies and all these other things, like they're, they're still there. They're not going anywhere, you know, and even if they do, people have had them in shot into their brain. So they're thinking in a different way now. And so it's going to produce new forms that you didn't predict. And yeah, maybe there'll be some sort of, you know, feudal, but it's not, it's not going back. Like, it's just, there is a degree to which like, yeah, maybe we should look at some older forms of certain things that'll work better. But uh, the idea that you can go back, that you can get back to that thing. It like, it's funny cause it's as utopian in a certain way as any ultra, you know, optimistic sci-fi, the idea that we can just get back, that we can make that thing that 
was so bad that people had the French Revolution and, <laughs> and the Russian Revolution. That was so bad. That pushed people to that. <laughs> we, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna be able to go back to that. I'm sure people will be fine with that. Yeah. And like I'm sure the capitalists will be fine with that. Yeah, you know, exactly. reverting to a non-capitalist mode of production. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that was grand, grand lads. We'll go straight back to just feudal lordships and like peasantry on the land. Yeah. Was there? Did he go in in in, in your version? Do you remember he talked about Edmund Burke's kind of theory of the sublime? Yes. <laughs> yes. yes. Well, one, one interesting thing he says repeatedly in the in the book is about how many of the actual, the highest exalted conservative minds actually were outsiders. Like De Maistre, De Maistre himself was like not French. He was from present day Italy. I think he was from Savoy. Like Burke, to my great disappointment, was Irish. Not only was he Irish, Burke. He actually went to my alma mater, my my college, Trinity. There was a building there named after him, Edmund Burke Theatre. But like, not only that, but like, Burke came even came from like a Catholic family, so he wasn't just like landed British gentry. He knew what was going on, and like that's that's what makes him so despicable as an Irish person to go over and be like the leading uh, reactionary in uh, British thought. You know, probably of all, like him and Hobbes, probably the two leading British reactionaries. So it's, it's particularly, uh, pr- particularly annoying. But the, the, and again, again, you see in America, I think he talks about Dinesh D'Souza in the book. Like so many of them are outsiders. But Burke himself comes up with a theory, a work called a philosophical inquiry into the origin of our ideas of the sublime and the beautiful, which. I found like in in the book where he 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 deals with this in in the second editions in chapter three, the soul of violence. I found it a very interesting theory. Normally, when I've read in the past right wing theory, I found right wing theory honestly, I found it particularly weak. You know, we might talk more about Hayek in a while. I read some Hayek, and I found it when I read it, I was quite I was quite surprised by how poor the argumentation was in Hayek. Burks comes up with this idea of the sublime here, which I think is a kind of an excellent insight. It's, it's certainly a, a worthy theory to understand the conservative mind. So he has this idea. So let, let me read here a little quote, maybe is the best way to do it. Burke develops a view of the, of the self desperately in need of negative stimuli of the sort provided by pain and danger which Burke associates with sublime. The sublime is most readily found in two political forms, hierarchy and violence. Rule may be sublime, but violence is more sublime. (laughs) Most sublime of all is when the two are fused. So basically, when you get into a very dangerous spot, say you're involved in a violent encounter, our, our mind is so entirely filled with, you know, this this danger or this pain that we have that it it arouses a rush in on the mind. And in face of these fears, the mind is like kind of, it's kind of pushed out. Your, your thought in these dramatic moments are pushed out of, you don't, you don't think in a conscious way. I was at a, in London a few years ago, I was at some march and it was down near like one of these places, shops where the Royal Family shop and there was a load of uh, anarchists were outside like chucking stuff. And I went down to have a look and I walked around onto the street. And then next thing from these major, on this major street, Piccadilly Street in London, like a big, big ass street, like like Fifth Avenue or something in New York, all of a sudden from the sides of all these streets came running out like police officers in riot gear you know like the kind of what do they call them like the in star wars what do they call them the stormtrooper gear and like they were just right running at me and i was just i wasn't involved in this at all and i i I turned around and i ran and i did not make any decision to do this i was gone like a fucking shot there was like literally there was like 200 cops just charging like battery charging and i was like holy god and there was horses running and I just ran down a side street and I turned into this side street. And who was there? Only another load of cops in stormtroopers. And I was like, holy fuck. And I jumped up and I climbed up onto this windowsill that was really high, like eight, six foot up. And I stood up on this windowsill and I was like kind of safe. And I was up there and my adrenaline was going. I was like, I at no stage when I'd made all that run and I did all that stuff, 
I made no decision. I mm. like I there was no conscious decision. Like so when I read this, like from Burke, it's like, yeah, my myself was completely annihilated in that moment. I acted on these like instinctual stuff. Right. Let, let me just finish this a little bit then. In the face, then he goes on, in the face of these fears, the mind is hurried out of itself. When we experience the sublime, we feel ourselves evacuated, overwhelmed by an external object of tremendous power and threat. Everything gives us a sense of internal being and vitality ceases to exist. The external is all. We are nothing. God is a good example and the ultimate expression of the sublime, as Burke wrote. While we contemplate so vast an object under the arm, as it were, of almighty power and invested upon every side with omnipresence, we shrink into the minuteness of our nature and in a manner we're annihilated before him. But paradoxically, we also feel uh, our existence to an extent that we never felt it before, like seized by terror, our attention is roused, our faculties are driven forward as, as it were, on guard, we are pulled out of ourselves. Sorry, so that was a long kind of a quote. So oh. you have this annihilation, but then you have this exhilaration of, of life like you've never experienced. You've got this like this crushing and this like exaltation at the same time. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 interesting. Like that that was the one of the things that really stuck out with me again, re, re, uh, re like going through that book again, because I feel like I've even heard people reference the sublime in that context before. I want to say it was like one of those like Joseph Campbell documentaries. And he was talking with somebody who was experiencing the blitzkrieg or something like that. And they were like, well, or another type of like, you know, war or something like that. Or it might've even been when they were losing and getting overrun. And, you know, they asked him, it was like, what was it like? And he said, Oh, it was, it was sublime. <laughs> like that was exactly the word that you had. <laughs> there are those moments when, yeah, you're not part of your ego anymore. You're part of the super ego but in a different way than maybe a leftist or a liberal would think about the superego. The way like the liberal would think about the superego maybe is more along the lines of like, we all need to do our part. We all need to wear a mask. We all need to social distance. But this is like, no, you have no choice but to react to this. You are reacting to this right now because this power is so overwhelming. You can't even thinking about wearing a man no you're not even thinking about doing the thing you need to do you're running and you're climbing up a fucking wall because you need to preserve yourself and this power is so just completely completely overwhelming and it's it's interesting i'm i'm into i, I do martial arts and i i think about this type of stuff in that context a lot because there's definitely been times when i uh, did a different martial art than i'm doing right now where like there was a bit of sublime sublimity to it where i was working with somebody who was very good and knew what they were doing and there is that fear but you and this is going to be a tangent on martial arts but i'm just let me go here because it's good but there's there's different types of martial arts and i do a martial art called bagua bagua zang and it's different in that it's internal where is that i've never heard of bagua zang. it's very it's 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 pretty obscure so there's all right there's three what they call internal Chinese martial arts. Now, all martial arts have an internal aspect to it. And you said inter you said external before external power. It made me think of this even bef before you said that. But so there's three internal martial arts. The one that people know it's very well known, although most people don't think of it as a martial art because it's often not practiced as it, and it it's frankly really hard to use as a martial art is Tai Chi. Tai Chi, yeah. Okay, and Tai Chi is an internal soft martial art it gives before force and then attacks where there's no force and then there's xing yi which is the opposite my force overwhelms your force okay and it's it's internal and i'll say what's relevant to that in a second and then there's the what i do is bagua bagua zhang it's based off the the eight trigrams and it's kind of an oscill it's the, based off the chinese book of changes it's like an oscillation between the two now there's different aspects to internal martial arts but one of the things that makes it internal is it's not reactive like that whereas in order to in order to get speed you're not training for muscle memory and in order to react because then you can just react to what the other person is doing and then that's can be you know less effective in a lot of instances so it's very much about 
mind intent. And actually, if you're able to train well enough, you're able to actually think and put your intentions into that action rather than just respond. This is just a tangent that I thought I would throw in there because I've been thinking a lot about this lately. <laughs> if you, <laughs> yeah. you want to check out a good podcast that just started up a few weeks ago, my teacher's teacher, Frank Allen, started a podcast called Whir The Whirling Circles Podcast. It's all about internal martial arts. He goes into the history and you know talks about what internal martial arts are and you know and like the differences between like different types of martial arts because like he's like look i love sports you know sports fighting but it's different than self-defense it's different than close quarters combat it's different than classical martial arts like yeah classical martial arts has some close quarters combat in it but it's not necessarily all going to work today and just like you know if you're doing sport fighting some of that stuff isn't good to do in a fight just like you know and there's, there's just the kind of differentiation between all those things it's good yes so uh back to the sublime where we're <laughs> so this idea of kind of self-annihilation like it, it seems to be like for, for Berkey describes it for one one reason why he likes hierarchy is because you experience the sublime that you have like a, a higher body which forces you to act you know like your boss or whatever but then also he makes this case that like you know there's nothing better in life than being able to follow a good leader I wonder like I thought a lot about about that like when I think about like say you know, when I worked in like jobs where I had an actual line boss that was good, you know, like actually sound, you know, not an asshole and good at their job. Did I enjoy being under them and being even then I would say, you know, obviously, you know, I'm not the type to I think some people like the submission as well. They uh -huh. like being annihilated in that. So um like uh, I'm wondering how universal. I suppose you're, you're talking about the conservative mind here, so it's not going to be universal. You know, no, I know. I know what you're saying, though, because because I I feel the same way. Like I do appreciate when somebody knows what they're doing, and like like there's something to be said about somebody who's good, a good administrator or a good leader. Like, and there are people who you want to follow or want to help out, and like, but I don't know if it's the best thing. It makes me think. Have you ever read uh, Grant Morrison's *The Invisibles*? No, that's worth checking out. That's a good graphic novel. But I mean, the the bad guys in that—that's like, it, it, I think their worldview very much lines up with that. Like, there's kind of like the the invisible college, uh, which is like the good guys, uh, more psychedelic realm. And then there's what is it called? It's like the outer church or something like that. And it's where it's where everything is like that. You know, like. Although maybe the, the person they're submitting to isn't good because it's a comic book and they're bad guys or whatever. But there is this sense of that sublimity, like of, of that sublime where you're submitting to something that's so powerful and there is like a freedom in that, you know. And I, I think for some people, sometimes literally, sometimes figuratively, they, they you know, you get off on that, like having that. Uh, you don't have to think, you know, this person has it figured out. Well, fuck, that's, you know, and I think there's probably... I'm sure that's an argument. In fact, I'm almost certain that's an argument that like slave owners had. Well, it's like, you know what? I'm I, I'm showing them the way that they, they don't know any better. This is the, you know, they're they're lucky that I'm doing this for them and that's why I'm great or whatever. You know? Yeah, so like this whole social hierarchy thing is you know, like you're annihilated by a, from your boss and then like you're aggrandized by like whoever the hell is below you. You know, and that you you people experience both the good and the bad of the hierarchy. And I think that really explains, you know, personally, I went to like a Catholic boarding school. And in like in the first year, we were the lowest of the low. We used to get like shit beat out of us. You know, we had a seniority thing. So if you're playing a game of football or something and somebody came along and wanted to sit down in the middle of the pitch and do nothing, who was from a year higher than you you'd have to get off the pitch. That was the rules. They had a strict seniority. Uh -huh. And it's like, so you were like constantly getting essentially annihilated <laughs> as a first year. And then in second year, suddenly you have this ability to like be aggrandized by the first years. So you can go out and basically, you know, terrorize them, just, just make their lives hell. You might be getting it from the year ahead of you, but you're now giving it to somebody. And, and suddenly it's like the hierarchy makes sense. And by the time like you, I left, even though it was against my in 
you know, it was against my natural nature. But by the time you're left, you go, oh, well, you know, it's hard at first, but, you know, then, like, you get your chance too. And, you know, so, like, I think it's a very seductive logic, this kind of annihilation and aggrandization that we get from, you know, both violence and hierarchy that I, I, I can see how it's very attractive to people as a way of social control for the people that run the place. Yeah, you know, you you put in your time. It seems like there's some meritocracy to it. Like, oh yeah, you, you put in your time. Okay, yeah, uh, y- yeah. There's a chance for you to move up a little bit, and you're not always eating shit, you know. Um, unless you're just one of those people who is unlucky enough to always be at the bottom. But like, uh, you make people think that they're not always going to be at the bottom, or there are where, or there are realms where they're not at the bottom. It's interesting. I went to a I went to Catholic high school as well. It wasn't boarding, but it was an all boys school. So that was, that was was nice. Deeply troubling. (laughs) Deeply damaging. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I hear you. There's another point he he makes in here about like how conservatives appeal to how they turn the idea of like the downtrodden that, you know, the left talks about, you know, the lowly, uh, these people who have nothing, but, and how they turn it on its head by talking about those who have, you know, the downfallen monarch, you know, who is now on the ground and is, is weak and poor, you know, how to get people on their side. Like, And he, he talks about how the newly fallen is a thing that's exploited by the right, that that actually allows the the rich, the ones that have had loss, to feel like they are the victim and to to play a kind of morality about getting these people back to what they deserve, as opposed to like the people who never had anything in Hollywood, they'd say there's no, there's no story arc there. You know, it's how Hollywood makes the case, you know, that's bullshit. Why you can't have like films about like just plumbers and stuff because there's no arc, you know, they have to be like a, a billionaire who loses everything and then comes back to something. But like this idea of recent loss, it's, it, it's something you even see like today and, you know, like let's think about like Trump, make America great again. We used to be something unbelievable. Now we're not. It's like Brexit. Oh, we want to be an independent empire again. You know, it's been stripped from us by those nefarious Germans and French in the European Union. This idea of like back to your previous position of hierarchy, it seems to be a very effective conservative ploy. Yeah, yeah, it's it's. And I think, again, it plays on that like idea that you're you're going to lose something. I see this so much in conservative media. It's it's like kind of crazy. Like, you know, I do do you know, I do this, the world's smallest violin, right? For all these for, you know, Mary Antoinette. Oh, OK, maybe that's not the best example, but but <laughs> but still, like for all these people who've, who've lost something. Somebody was on Twitter. The, yeah, I think yesterday complaining about like how you know that let them eat cake uh, okay. line she was saying well actually it was actually let them eat brioche yes. and like it's been totally misinterpreted like those fucking leftists <laughs> yeah yeah exactly and uh, uh, yeah it's it's weird like i feel like this is the conservative game they want you to they want to uh, it's it's like almost cliche to say at this point you know they'll talk about these sjw's complaining and stuff but then, you know, Jordan Peterson will cry about young men who no longer have a shot at the type of family or economic life that people had a generation or two ago. And that's like a real loss. Like it, it is like it's not it's nothing that's like to be that should be laughed at. But it's still like it's still like. It's a loss. It's not somebody who never had anything at all, who's probably you should be more concerned with, especially since the people that are having experiencing this loss, like it's just a little bit less. When I was looking into when I made this video about about cucks and like this, like this whole phenomenon, the, the kind of the conclusion that I came to and, and looking into it was that like it's not so much that these guys that throw this word around as an insult are like afraid that they're going to get cocked. I think, which they are, but, but it's not just that 
It's that they're actually <laughs> it's that they're actually afraid that the cucks might have it better than them. Like you know, like when you see some of these reactionaries and the way they respond to things, like I get the impression they don't understand women. They probably don't have great relationships with women. They probably might not have great sex lives because of this. And when I look at these cucks, like even these guys that are, I mean, I think most of them still have sex with their wives. They probably have more sex with their wives than these reactionaries who are complaining about, you know, Cardi B, you know, Ben Shapiro's wife and her, her, her dry ass pussy. <laughs> you know, like they, they probably have it better off. I think even the guys who are like, you know, locked in like dick cages and stuff, I bet you they, all right, maybe they're not having as much sex, but they probably have more intimacy in their lives, you know? <laughs> and so I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of insecurity. I think if, you know, if people held on to some of these things a little less tightly, they might get something better, but it's. Yeah. It's a strange, that cook phenomenon has like really exploded. Like in the, in the last four or five years, it's kind of like, it was not a term. Like if you had to said a uh, cook or cook holes, to somebody in 2014 unless they were like a shakespeare scholar there's a good chance they wouldn't even know what you were talking about yeah i mean that's the only time the only time i think i've heard the word was like reading shakespeare or chaucer and like i think i heard it once in a movie and so when i heard it pop up again i was like i have where'd that come from like what people are reading shakespeare again what's going on <laughs> Yeah, like there's a, my missus says like she did a degree in uh, literature and uh, she had to read a lot of the older stuff. Um, I think it was Shakespeare. She said like Shakespeare had an expression for like women's breasts was saggy dugs. She always mentions that. I think that's Shakespeare was, that was quite a crude name for, 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 oh. for poor old Shakespeare. You can use that one now when you're having an argument with your missus and complain about her saggy dugs. Yeah. What do you reckon, oh, Greg? Yeah. That'll help. <laughs> old style. We're going old style here today. Uh, yeah. You know, I think that there is like in in that area, there's a deep level of it, it expresses something very deep about society that that is the current use of the word cook says something very deep because it's not purely about your wife. Yeah. Having an affair. It's something way more derogatory. <laughs> Yeah, like yeah. it's like she has to do it in front of you to show you essentially how a real man would do it so it's kind of like it says something deep about how men how a large section of men i think interact with women like i, I think i've said to people before like i think quite a substantial number of men who i don't think are psychotic let me put it that way have difficulty at least in their external discussion and i think their personal interrelations with women in kind of understanding that like a woman is actually a sentient being <laughs> and a human it, it's it's kind of amazing i mean and i I don't think I was like that when I was younger, but I don't know. I mean, I, I, I don't think I was like that, but I look at maybe I, I try and show, I try and be generous and chalk it up to like age and things. But then I see it amongst people who are older and should, should know better. But yeah, it's, it's weird. There's definitely a sense of like loss associated with that word. There's, there's like an extreme sense of loss and it's like tied up in this, you know, like economic loss, like, you know, you used to be able to, in, in, in the States at least, you could have a high school education and maybe not everyone, but you had a better chance of like getting a job where you could, you could support a family and stuff. And now that's just, it's kind of not the case anymore. You need a college degree and you're going to go into debt and maybe more than that. And maybe that field isn't in existence anymore or isn't lucrative enough for you to support yourself. And maybe your wife is in one of this caring or service sectors and she makes more than you and like, my wife's a veterinarian she pays the bill so like uh, you know so sweet sweet <laughs> um so it, it's tough like it, it, you know it, it's tough like I, I think it's a big change for a lot of people and a big a big loss for a lot of people and 
oddly enough, I, I kind of, I, I mean this sincerely, like when I was researching the, the cuck thing, like I kind of respect these guys. I can't do that. I don't, I'm not secure enough of myself for that. And, uh, one of the guys I was that it interviews them, he's a, he's a, he's, a, he's what they call a bull. And I, I was <laughs> explain this. <laughs> this is a term I have not heard. Yeah. So, so the, this one guy has got a podcast and he's, he's a bull. And so there's the, there's the cock, there's the husband, there's the wife. She's called like the hot wife usually. And then there's the, th th the third in there. He's the bull. He's the guy who sleeps with, you know, sleeps with the wife. And I, I listened to his podcast and I was expecting him to like, you know, be derogatory towards these guys. Totally the opposite. Totally the opposite. Like, oh, I have such respect for these men. And da, 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 da. and I'm so I feel so grateful that they let me experience that the love they have between each other. And I was like, shit, I don't know anything about this, I guess. Huh? I need to dig into this a little deeper. It's interesting. It's it's a black guy and it, it's interesting because he's also in like a he has a partner or whatever and she you know they they share too as well so he, he kind of gets it from both sides he kind of understands both sides a little bit so it's interesting to hear him talk it's an interesting <laughs> phenomenon it's very it's very fascinating i i don't know i think yeah i'm i'm, I'm gonna have to do some more work in this work research deeper. more research <laughs> i think i've done more than enough research to be quite honest um <laughs> You're worn right. out with all your research. Yeah. On this episode, you heard the team tune, the order of the Pharaonic Jesters, the Antique Blacks, and Night of the Purple Moon by Sun Ra and his orchestra. Thank you for listening, and please join me for the next episode of From Alpha to Omega. This show is a member of the Emancipation Network, a Marxist podcast and research collective. Make sure to check out our network sister podcasts, General Intellect Unit, Jumpsuit Utopia, Mortal Science and Swampside Chats. Thank you.